the expedition to find the Britannic has arrived in the waters of the island of Key in the Aegean Sea. They are guided by coordinates taken by Jacques Cousteau 20 years before. Dr. Ballard boards the submarine for the first dive. All right. All right, welcome aboard. Well, oh, thank you. You ready to go? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, let's dive. The NR-1 is a unique submarine, a U.S. Navy ship designed for scientific research and covert missions. It can dive to 3,000 feet and cruise underwater at three and a half knots. It's a bird. Yeah. Die, die. The NR1 is 12 and a half feet wide and 145 feet in length, half as long as a naval attack submarine. Its nuclear power source takes up two-thirds of the space. The crew of 11 works, eats and sleeps in the remaining third. It's a little cramped. Cameras mounted on the hull give the search team a close-up view of the undersea environment. But the real work of detection and navigation is performed by a new sonar system. If the Britannic is anywhere near its last reported position, this sonar will soon find her. So you ran that at 230 foot altitude, was that your? 230 foot depth. Depth. Altitude was about 60. In 1975, traditional sonar had failed Jacques Cousteau. After weeks of searching, he turned to Dr. Harold Edgerton and his new device, the side scan sonar. With the British Admiralty's coordinates so far off Britannic's true position, Cousteau might never have found the wreck without side scan. Over an hour into the dive, and still no trace of the ship. Right. Wait for a new there. That's the ship. The sonar has locked on the Britannic. Looks like the rudder and propellers right there. That's the sweep of the hull. That would be the bottom. That would be the superstructure. So it looks like we're coming in on the stern. Okay. You're coming in this way. You're coming in from the from the northeast. Right. Sure. Okay. That sounds right. And then we'll see whether we see a bow or a propeller. Yeah. <laughs> That'll tell us, but it looks like it's believable. Thank you, Mr. Cousteau. Captain. Ghostly black and white images from the submarine's cameras offer a first look at the once proud liner. The first class promenade deck designed for society's elite. The second class smoking room where gentlemen could retire after dinner. The lifeboat davits, still in position to lower the boats. The pictures are unprecedented, but fail to give Ballard an accurate overview of the ship. For that, you'll have to rely on the modern version of side-scan sonar. Printed out on board the support ship, the side scan images are unrolled for all to see. Look at that. Um, this oh, wow, amazing. look at that. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's a photograph. Look at the bridge. Look at the docking collar. 
docking bridge right there. Look at that. Look at this. It even shows cables lying on the hull, the shadow of the cables, and every strake in the hull plating, which visually, from the submarine, you can, can hardly even make out. The sonar imaging system reveals a full silhouette of the wreck. Ballard and his team are elated. Yeah, so uh, it will help. It's yours from here. Yeah, uh, you can go home. I know. I... Look at this. Every, the slightest little relief. This, here's where you see the top of the davits, and that's where the compass tower shows up. Right? Oh, my God. Look at that. You can see through the, the through rudder the, uh, to the other propeller. Ken, you're out of a job. It's the first evidence that Britannic is as well preserved as Ballard had hoped. Here lies a pristine version of Titanic. Let's talk about uh, what we're going to do next. So I would like to just get the NR1 in position and go and image it for a while. You know, put the NR1 down and approach it, and then try to move down into the boat deck area on that boat deck. You know, these davits are here, though. Those these are, davits those are, are here. Those are problem. You don't but want to get. You want to sort of. I'd like to be above the vehicle down and hold it at some high horizon, 150 feet or something. Wait for you. What do you? I would think it'd probably be better to have it down lower, but I don't. Tomorrow, Ballard will return to the Britannic for the first complete survey of the wreck on film. By 1916, fighting had spread far from the trenches of Belgium and France to the eastern Mediterranean. The struggle to control the Dardanelles would claim tens of thousands of lives. As the numbers of wounded rose, the British Admiralty was faced with the task of getting them back to Britain. The uh, ships that had been uh, requisitioned for use, uh, mainly Union Castle uh, ships, were not providing adequate uh, uh, space to remove the uh, sick and wounded. The whole system actually in the eastern Mediterranean was on the verge of breaking down. You have these uh, six or eight thousand ton ships and literally thousands of casualties occurring during the course of a given week. So w within a very short time, the largest ships available, Aquitania, Mauritania, and Britannic, are placed into hospital ship service. On Britannic's return trips to England filled with wounded, every minute was devoted to patients. But on her outbound journeys, the medical staff had little to do leaving time to enjoy the amenities of a first-class cruise. The sixth voyage was no different. The mood was relaxed as the Britannic entered the Aegean. But a dangerous and unpredictable threat lurked beneath the waters. U-boat submarines. Invisible to surface shipping, they could fire torpedoes or lay underwater mines. In either case, Britannic was defenseless. November the 21st, 1916. At 8 a.m., the medical staff had just sat down to breakfast when, without warning... There was a shudder that went through the ship. That's the way Sheila Mitchell described it. And she... Uh, said that everybody froze. The Britannic had been hit. Had she been returning to England with her full quota of 3,000 patients, the loss of life would have rivaled Titanic's. But thanks to the efficient lifeboat system installed after Titanic's sinking, most on board would escape. Sheila Mitchell, a nurse on the Britannic, was interviewed by Jacques Cousteau. Everybody's heart was in their mouths. When she was turning, of course, I was thinking, oh, my trunks will be sliding under the other girl's bed. And all the oranges and lemons I bought in Naples will be on the floor. <laughs> and where is my clock? You know, things like that. 
The speed with which the Britannic sank is one of her great mysteries. This period footage can only simulate the awe-inspiring sight of watching such a massive ship disappear. Fully redesigned to benefit from the lessons of Titanic, she went down in a mere 55 minutes. The, the Britannic was in the very early stages of her construction when the Titanic sank. They stopped the construction and rethought everything in order to make Britannic really, really safe. And they learned from the Titanic. They made the bulkheads much, much higher. They gave her a complete double hull, a double skin, so that it just covered all the bases. And here she went down in less than an hour. For Simon Mills and Eric Sorder, the bigger mystery surrounds the cause of the initial explosion, mine or torpedo. There you go. At the time of the sinking, everybody thought it was a torpedo. It had to be. You know, they were at war. The Germans, the, the filthy Hun, they wanted to sort of sink this ship. It was a powerful competitor after the war. They had to sink it, and torpedo was the only way to do it. As time went by, it wasn't quite so clear cut. Even the English officer carrying out the inquiry decided that uh, there was no definite evidence one way or the other to say mine or torpedo. I propose to drink to the Britannic, to the splendid ship that you have been on board and that had such a tragic fate. Sixty years on, Jacques Cousteau gathered together Britannic's remaining survivors. What is your opinion? Was the ship torpedoed or did they see the mine? Oh, torpedo. Without a doubt. Without a doubt, torpedo. Thank you. Now you, Mr. Without a doubt, torpedo. At least one, one torpedo. My opinion is you talk about torpedo. I say torpedo. It was a mine without a shadow of doubt. So that way we don't have to do anything. We just get out of their way. They come in underneath us and reposition their chin on that, and then we use their lights. Now the trickiest part of the whole expedition. The submarine will combine with two ROVs, remotely operated vehicles with cameras. Um, she couldn't turn by the rudder because the, uh, she was disabled. She had to turn by the screw, so in fact she probably turned in quite a, a tight area, I think. Pretty tight. Pretty tight, not by the rudder. And so, uh, there should be also the... Ballard wants to explore the site of the explosion. If the ROVs can maneuver into the damaged area, the hidden recesses of the gash may explain the mysterious explosion and the rapid sinking. The ROVs are lowered over the side. The submarine is in position, her powerful lights scanning the wreck. Ballard and his team are in the command station on board the support ship. All eyes focus on the monitors connected to the ROV cameras. Ballard directs both ROVs, controlling the robots from a distance of several hundred feet. Tension rises as the team awaits the first clear image of the once majestic ship. There it is. We're at the hull. The Britannic. Safer. More luxurious than her sisters. <laughs>